The Solid Muldoon by Rudyard Kipling Narrated by Robin Nixon Did you see John Malone with his chain and brand new hat? Did you see how he whacked with his grand aristocrat? There was flags and banners waving high, and dress and style was shown, but the best of all the company was Mr John Malone. John Malone there had been a royal dogfight in the ravine at the back of the rifle butts between Leroy's jock and Ortheris's blue rot, both mongrel ramper hounds, chiefly ribs and teeth. It lasted for twenty happy howling minutes, and then blue rot collapsed, and Ortheris paid Leroy three rupees, and we were all very thirsty. A dogfight is a most heating entertainment, quite apart from the shouting, because rampers fight over a couple of acres of ground. Later, when the sound of belt badges clicking against the necks of beer bottles had died away, conversation drifted from dog to man fights of all kinds. Humans resemble red deer in some respects. Any talk of fighting seems to wake up a sort of imp in their breasts, and they bell one to the other, exactly like challenging bucks. This is noticeable even in men who consider themselves superior to privates of the line. It shows the refining influence of civilization and the march of progress. Tail provoked tail, and each tail more beer. Even dreamy Leroy's eyes began to brighten, and he unburdened himself of a long history in which a trip to Malham Cove, a girl at Pately Brig, a ganger himself, and a pair of clogs were mixed in a drawling tangle. And so our coots heard you open from Tinty here, and he was a bed for the matter of a month, concluded Leroy pensively. Uh, Mulvaney came out of reverie. He was lying down and flourished his heels in the air. You're a man, Leroy, said he critically, but you've forgotten with man, and that's an everyday experience. But I've stood up to a ghost, and that was not an everyday experience. No, said Ortheris, throwing a cork at him. You get up and address the ass, you and your experiences. Is it a bigger one nor usual? Uh, "'Twas the living trot, answered Mulvaney, stretching out a huge arm and catching Ortheris by the collar. "'Now where are you, me son? Will you take the word of the Lord out of me mouth another time?' He shook him to emphasise the question. "'No, something else, though,' said Ortheris, making a dash at Mulvaney's pipe, capturing it and holding it at arm's length. "'I'll chuck it across the ditch if you don't let me go. "'You marauding heathen, tis the only cutty I've ever loved.' Handle her tender or chuck you across the nola. If that pipe was broke, I'll give her back to me, sir. Ortheris had passed the treasure to my hand. It was an absolutely perfect clay, as shiny as the black ball at pull. I took it reverently, but it was firm. Uh, will you tell us about the ghost fight, if I do? I said. Is it the story that's troubling you? Of course I will. I meant to all along. I was only getting at me own way, as Pop Doggle said when they found him, trying to ram a cartridge down the muzzle. Arteris, fall away. He released the little Londoner, took back his pipe, filled it, and his eyes twinkled. He has the most eloquent eyes of anyone that I know. Did I ever tell ye, he began, that I wasn't the devil of a man? Ye did, said Leroy, with a childish gravity that made Atheris yell with laughter, for Mulvaney was always impressing upon us his great merits in the old days. Did I ever tell ye, Mulvaney continued calmly, that I was once more of a devil than I am now? Maria, you don't mean it, said Ortheris. When I was a corporal, I was reduced afterward, but as I was saying, when I was a corporal, I was a devil of a man. He was silent for nearly a minute, while his mind rummaged among old memories, and his eye glowed. He bit upon the pipe stem and charged into his tail. Ah, yeah, they was great times. I'm old now. Me hides wore off in patches. Since we go has disconceited me, and I'm a married man too. But I've had me day. I've had me day, and nothing can take away the taste of that. Oh, me time passed, when I put me foot through every living one of the Ten Commandments, between Reveille and Lights Out, blew the froth of a pewter, wiped me moustache with the back of me hand, and slept on it, all as quiet as a little child. But it's over. It's over, and will never come back to me. No, though I prayed for a week of Sundays. Was there anyone in the old regiment to touch Corporal Terence Mulvaney when that same was turned out for Seruchkin? I never met him. Every woman that was not a witch was worth the running after in those days, and every man was me dearest friend, or I'd strip to him and we knew which was the better of the tie. When I was corporal, I would not have changed with the colonel, nor yet the commander-in-chief. I would be sergeant, there was nothing I would not buy, 
Uh, Mother of heaven, look at my uh, foot I'm nigh. Uh, we was quarrelled and a bit contentment. Uh, it is no matter of use naming names, for it might not have the barracks disreputation. And I was the emperor of the earth to me own mind. And one or three women thought the same. A uh, small blame to them. After we had lain there a year, Bragan, the colour sergeant of E Company, went and took a wife that was a lady's maid to come, big lady in the station. She's dead now, is Annie Bragan, died in childbed at Kerpital, or it may have been Almora. Uh, seven, uh, nine years gone, and Bragan he married again. Uh, but she was a pretty woman when Bracken introduced her in Cantonment Society. She had eyes like the brine of a butterfly's wing, when in the sun catches it, and a waist not tickered on me arm, and a little soft button of a mouth. I would have gone through all Asia, bristling with bayonets to get the kiss of her, and her hair was as long as the tail of the colonel's charger. Oh, forgive me mentioning that blundering best and the same mouthful with Annie Bragan, uh, which was all shun gold and time, and was when it was more in diamonds to me. There was never a pretty woman yet, and I've struck with a few could open the door to Annie Bregan. Uh, it was in the Catholic chapel. I saw her first, me eye roiling round, as usual, for what was to be seen. Uh, you're too good for bragging, me love, thinks I to myself. Uh, but that's a mistake I could put straight, or me name is not Terence Mulvaney. Now, nah, take me word for it. You are thrust there, me riding. Keep out of the mad corridors, as I did not. No good ever comes of it. And there's always a chance of you being fined with your face in the dirt, a long picket in the back of your hand, and your hands playing fifes on the tread of another man's doorstep. Uh, it was so we found O'Hara, he that Rafferty killed six years gone, when he went to his death with his hair oiled, whistling a Larry O'Rourke between his teeth. Uh, keep out of the marred cord, as I say, as I do not. Tis unwholesome, tis dangerous, and tis everything else is bad, but, oh, my soul, tis sweet while it lasts. I was always hanging about there when I was off duty and bragging wasn't, but never a sweet word beyond ordinary did I get from Annie Bragan. Tis a perversity of the sect, says I to myself, and give me cap another cock of me head and straighten me back. It was the back of a drum major in those days, and went off though. I did not care with all the women in the marred corridors laughing. I was persuaded more boys are, and thinking that no woman born of woman could stand against me if I held up my little finger. I had reason for thinking that way till I met Annie Bragan. Time and again, when I was blending hair in the dusk, a man would go past me as quiet as a cat. That's queer, thinks I. For am I? Or should I be the only man in these parts? Now what devilment can Annie be up to? Uh, then I call myself a blaggard for thinking such things. But I thought them all the same, and that, mark ye, is the way of a man. Now, one evening I said, uh, Mrs. Bragan, mind I notice this wreck to you? Uh, who's that corporal man? I seen the stripes, though I could never get sight of his face. Who is that corporal man that comes in always when I'm going away? Oh, mother of God, says she, turning as white as me belt. Have you seen him, too? I seen him, says I. Of course I have. Uh, did you want me not to see him? For we were standing talking in the dark outside the veranda of Bragan's quarters. You better tell me to shut me eyes, unless I'm mistaken he's come now. And sure enough, the corporal man was walking to us, hanging his head down as though he was ashamed of himself. Uh, good night, Mrs. Bragan, says I. You're very cool. Tis not for me to interfere with your morals, but you might manage some things with more decency. I'm off to Cantine, I says. I turned on me heel and went, swearing I would give that man a dressing that would stop him messing about with married quarters for a month and a week. I had not tucked in paces before Annie Bragan was hanging onto me arm, and I could feel that she was shaking all over. Stay with me, Mr. Mulvaney, says she. You're flesh and blood of the least, are you not? I'm all that, says I. Me anger went away in a flash. Will I want to be asked twice, Annie? Uh, with that, I slipped me arm round her waist for a big ad. I fancied she'd surrendered a discretion at the honours of war were mine. What nonsense is this, says she, drawing herself up on the tips of her dear little toes. Uh, with the mother's milk not trying your impudent might. Uh, let go, she says. Uh, did you not say just now I was flesh and blood, says I? I have not changed sense, I says, and I kept me arm where it was. Your arms to yourself, says she, and her eyes sparkled. Sure, it is only human nature, says I, and get me arm where it was. Nature or no nature, says she, you take your arm away or I'll tell Bregan, and he'll alter the nature of your head for what you take me for, she says. A woman, says I, the prettiest in parks. A wife, says she, the straightest in cantonments. Uh, with that, I dropped me arm, fell back two paces and saluted, uh, for I saw that she meant what she said. Then uh, you know something that some men would give a good deal to be certain of. How could you tell? I demanded, in the interests of science. Watch the hand, said Mulvaney. Uh, if she shut her hand tight, thumb down over the knuckle, take up your hat and go. 
Uh, you'll only make a fool of yourself if you stay. But if the hand lays open in the lap, or if you see her trying to shut it, and uh, she can't, go on, she's not past reasoning with... Uh, well, as I was saying, I fell back, saluted, and was going away. Uh, stay with me, she says. Look, he's coming again. As she pointed me to the veranda, and by the height of importance, the corporal man was coming out of Braggin's quarters. He's done that these five evenings past, says Annie Bregan. Off, oh, what will I do? He'll not do it again, says I, for I was fighting mad. I keep away from a man that has a thrifle crust in love for the fevers died down. He rages like a brute beast. He went up to the man in the veranda, meaning as sure as I sit to knock the life out of him. He slipped into the open. Of what you doing philandering about how you scum of the gutter, says I, polite to give him his warning, for I wanted him ready. He never lifted his head, but says all mournful and melancholious, as if he thought I'd be sorry for him. I can't find her, says he. My trust, says I, you've lived too long. You and your seekings and finding in a decent married woman's quarters. Hold up your head, you frozen thief of Genesis, says I, and you're finding you want more. Uh, but he never held up, and I let go from the shoulder to wear the hair is short over the eyebrows. Uh, that'll do your business, says I. But I nearly did mine instead. I put me body weight behind the blow, uh, but it did nothing at all, and near put me shoulder out. The corporal man was not there, and Annie Bregan, who had been watching from the veranda, throws up her heels and carries on like a cock within his necks wrung by a drummer's boy. I went back to her, uh, for a living woman and a woman like Annie Bregan is more than a parade ground full of ghosts. I'd never seen a woman faint before, and I stood like a stuck calf, asking her whether she was dead and praying for that love of me, and the love of her husband, and the love of the virgin, to open her blessed eyes again, and uh, calling myself all the names under the canopy of heaven for plague, and her weed mis miserable amours, when I ought to have stood between her and this corporal man that had lost the number of his mess. I misremember what nonsense I said. But it was not so far gone that I could not hear a foot on the dirt outside. Uh, it was Bregan coming in, and by the same token, Annie was coming too. I jumped to the far end of the veranda and looked as if butter wouldn't melt in me mouth. But Mrs. Quinn, the quartermaster's wife that was, had told Bregan about me hanging around Annie. I'm not pleased with you, Mulvaney, says Bregan, unbuckling his sword, for he'd been on duty. Uh, that's bad hearing, I says, and I knew the pickets were driving in. Uh, what for, sergeant, says I. Come outside, says he, and I'll show you why. Uh, I'm willing, I says, but me stripes are none so well that I can afford to lose them. Tell me now, who do I go out with, says I. He was a quick man, and just and saw what I'd be after. Oh, and Mrs. Bregan's husband, says he. He might have known by asking me that favour I'd done him no wrong. We went to the back of the arsenal, and I stripped him, and for ten minutes twas all I could do to prevent him killing himself against me fists. He was mad as a dumb dog, just frothing with rage, but he'd no chance with me in the rage of learning or anything else. Oh, will you hear reason, says I. When his first wind was run out, not what I can see, says he. Oh, and that, I gave him both, one after the other, smashed through the low guard that he'd taught when he was a boy, and the eyebrow shut down on the cheekbone like a wing of a sick crow. Ah, oh, will you hear reason now, you brave man, says I. Not while I can speak, says he, staggering up blind as a stump. Oh, he was loath to do it, but I went around and swung in the jaw side, and shifted a half pace to the lath. Will you hear reason now, says I. I can't keep my temper much longer, and tis like I will hurt ye. Not while I can stand, he mumbles out of a corner of his mouth. So I closed and threw him, blind dumb and sick, and jammed the jaw straight. You're an old fool, Mr. Bregan, says I. You're a young thief, says he, and you've broke me heart, you an Annie Betunia. And then he been crying like a child as he lay. I was sorry he'd never been before. Tis an awful thing to see a strong man cry. I'll swear on the cross, says I. I care for none of your oaths, says he. Uh, come back to your quarters, says I, and if you don't believe the living begad, you shall listen to the dead, I says. I oisted him and took him back to his quarters. Mrs. Bregan, says I, here's a man that you can cure quicker than me. You've shamed me before me wifey whimpers. Have I so, says I. By the look on Mrs. Bregan's face, I think I'm dressing down far worse than I gave ye. And I was, and he Bregan was wild with indignation. There was not a name in that decent woman could use that was not given my way. I've had me colonel walk round me like cup around a cask for fifteen minutes only room because I went out the corner shop an unstrapped lunatic. But all that I ever took from his rasp of a tongue was a ginger popped foot, Annie told me, and that mark ye is the way of a woman. Well, it was done for want of a breath, and Annie was bending over her husband. I says, "'Tis all true, and I'm a blighted, and you're an honest woman, but will you tell him of one service that I did ye?' As I finished speaking, the corporal man came up to the veranda, and Annie Bregan squealed. The moon was up, and we could see his face. I can't find us, says the corporal man, and went out like the puff of a candle. 
Saints stand between us and evil, says Brigan, crossing himself. That's fly here of the Tyrone. Oh, who was he, says I, for he was giving me a deal of a fight in this day. Uh, Brigan told us that Flahey was a corporal who lost his wife of cholera in those quarters three years gone and went mad in walks and after they buried him hunting for her. Well, says I to Brigan, he's hooking out the purgatory to keep company with Miss Brigan every evening for the last fortnight. You may tell Mrs Quinn with me love, for I know that she's been talking to you and you've been listening that she ought to understand the diff twixt between a man and a ghost. She's had three husbands, says I, and you've got a wife for good uh, for you, instead of which you leave her to be buried by ghosts and all manner of evil spirits. I'll never go talking in the way of politeness to a man's wife again. Uh, good night to you both, says I. And with that I went away, having fought with woman, man and devil in all the heart of an hour. Uh, by the same token, I gave Father Victor one rupee to say a mass for Flahey's soul, me having discommoded him by sticking me fist into his system. Your ideas of politeness seem rather large, Mulvaney, I said. That's as ye look at it, said Mulvaney calmly. Annie Bregan never cared for me. For all that, I did not want to leave anything behind me that Bregan could take her of to be angry with her about. With an honest word could have cleared it all up. There's nothing like up and spiking. Oh, there is, yes, Scott. Let me put me eye in the bottle, for me throat's as dry as when I thought I would get a cast from Annie Bregan. And that's fourteen years gone. Ayah. Cooks on city and the blue sky above it. And the times it was. The times that was.'